The Bob Murphy Show, episode 329. Oh, 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 oh. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here is your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Bob Murphy Show. Today, ooh, I hope you're ready to put your thinking caps on, kids, because I'm talking again with Steve Patterson. Let me just, I'll just lay my cards on the table. Steve is either a genius or he's deluded about his own capabilities relative to everybody else's, put it that way. I'm not sure yet which of those two he's in. But I can't rule out that he's a genius. And so let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Before I've had him on to talk about why the mathematicians are wrong about the nature of infinity. And, you know, he goes through the history of mathematicians and points out when the trouble crept in, that sort of stuff. And now we're going to be talking about his attempted solution to the mind body problem. Another little uh, feather in his cap. And it intersected with some stuff I've been doing. And so then I said, all right, you know what, Steve, why don't you come on the podcast? And we'll just talk. So again, either, let's put it this way, 30 years from now, people would look back at this and either think, <laughs> listen to these two blowhards, they don't even know what they're talking, just two midwits talking to each other, or they're going to be like, whoa, I can't believe these guys were off on some fringe podcast when they were like cutting edge. It's going to be one of those two things, and I don't know which one. I'm hoping for one, but... I'll let you try to guess which one. All right, here we go. Listen to Steve and me talk about some deep things. Steve, welcome back to the Bob Murphy Show. Thanks for having me. So I think we're going to talk about something this episode, folks, that's a little less controversial than infinity in mathematics, namely the mind-body problem, dualism, that sort of thing. Much easier issues to resolve <laughs> and less likely to generate hate mail. Mm -hmm. So... The one of the motivations for this discussion, and as we talk, it'll become clearer, folks. But I recently was at the Mises Institute. It was the anniversary of human action. I guess what seventy fifth, yeah, seventy fifth anniversary of human action, and so a bunch of us were there, and we all are contributing to this volume of you know what did human action mean in my career, that sort of thing. And so I chose to focus on methodological dualism and calculation. So for this podcast episode here, we didn't talk about calculation, but as far as the methodological dualism, and I was explaining how I didn't appreciate it at the time when I first got my hands on human action, I just want to say, oh, what's the business cycle? How does that, or whatever, you know, why, why are minimum wage laws bad? But Mises spends the first big chunk of the book going through what, geez, this sounds like philosophy. When does the economics start? But now, of course, from my vantage point, I'm much more understanding of why Mises thought you got to build a foundation before you build a house kind of thing. And one of the central points that he made is in the social sciences, we necessarily have to embrace methodological dualism and what he meant by that. And why does he have that um, adjective methodological in front of it? He, as I understood it, at least as of what he wrote in human action, he wasn't taking a stand on saying, you know, in some grand metaphysical scheme, like, are, is there really a separate spirit realm? And then there's the physical matter. He was just saying for practical purposes as social scientists and what we do in everyday life too, when you navigate this world, you, a trip, you employ the hypothesis that certain clumps of matter are being motivated by and influenced by other entities that have minds that have desires or preferences, if you know, in economics, and that that's just you get you do better using that hypothesis rather than just try to analyze everything as mindless matter in motion obeying 
the blind laws of physics, even right. even if you think at some level that is true and you could describe every cell that way still, you know, so that's kind of, you know, where I was publicly talking about dualism again. And then I don't know, at this point, Steve, do you want to enter the chat? Sure. Um, one note on this you'll, you'll probably find funny is um, on the question of methodological dualism. So um, the 20th century, people were really trying to sound like physicists mm -hmm. and mathematicians to sound impressive. Mm -hmm. And so when you get into some stuff in the philosophy of mind and in psychology, things got so wonky in the early 20th century that um, the natural way that we describe how humans operate in the world, that they are you know, minds that have ideas, they have beliefs, they have values, this is a deeply intuitive way of talking about the behavior of other humans. They categorize this as folk psychology. Right, so, right. So literally mm -hmm. talking about like, you have ideas, they go, well, you know, I got to pat you on the head. I mean, idea, what, what is an idea? That's kind of a lay way of understanding <laughs> things. I always thought that was funny. But um, yep. anyway, so I, I listened to the lecture that you gave. And uh, you were talking about the, the importance of methodological dualism. And you said, um, it was funny, because you were approaching human action from the economics point of view, you were like, okay, you know, the first part of human action, there's philosophy, there's methodology, there's some of the stuff on a priorism comes up, which we have talked about before. And you're like, okay, well, maybe we'll, let's just get to the economic stuff. And my uh, experience reading human action was the opposite. I just kept getting stuck on those first, like, I don't know, it was 100 pages or whatever, where he's talking about the, the philosophy and he's talking about the methodology. And I'm like, there's something so important and profound here. It was mm -hmm. harder for me to get into the uh, econ economics because I was hung up on, the, uh, on those first, you know, I don't know what it is, 50, 100 pages. Anyway. Um, so I love Mises' recognition of methodological dualism that he, he just recognizes, look, the world is, you know, maybe in some, you know, advanced civilization will have a way to reduce human behavior down to the laws of physics and movement of atoms, but we're, we really aren't there now mm -hmm. and we're still not here now in, you know, 2024. And so we have to use the concepts, we have to use other concepts mm -hmm. other, than, other than physics. And so there's a natural question, which is, okay, well, how deep does this rabbit hole go? Do we have to use these different concepts because actually in the world there are deep distinctions between entities? Um, I'm going to use you know one, one big uh, $5 word here. Are there ontological distinctions? Ontological, it, 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 ontology is the, is the study of a being, like at the, at the mm -hmm. most fundamental level. Are there different categories of being? So you have the physical stuff, you have the you know, maybe atoms. Do you have mental stuff or experiences? They seem experiences, conscious experiences and atoms seem like maybe these are irreducible aspects of nature. You can't really reduce the experience down to the atom. A another candidate would be, you know, numbers or abstract stuff. Mm -hmm. So if I were to say, you know, like how heavy is the number three? You'd be right. like, well, that seems like a category error. Like the number three is not a thing that has weight. It's not a right. it's not a mental thing. It seems like to be its its own into its own category. So, natural question is maybe you know, or natural way of thinking is to say maybe the methodological dualism of Mises ports onto a metaphysical dualism. Maybe in fact there is a strong mm -hmm. distinction between mental stuff and physical stuff, and maybe maybe other stuff. And so you know, just getting into philosophy here. The, the, like the modern uh, establishment of a metaphysical dualism, like the way philosophers talk about it nowadays, was sort of established with Descartes, Rene Descartes. And he came up with Cartesian dualism, this idea that mind and body are in fundamentally separate ontological categories, which appeals to, I think, a lot of our natural intuition. Um, it's very hard to get rid of either the physical world or the mental world. Seems like you got to have them both. Mm -hmm. And even philosophers who are very skeptical of this position even the ones that think it's wrong appreciate that it is naturally intuitive, but there's a huge mm. problem with metaphysical dualism, which is called the interaction problem. Mm -hmm. If it's the case that mind and body are in fundamentally separate ontological categories, how do they interact with one another? It's like, um, if you imagine, you know, like we're talking about the, the ghost in the machine, like Casper is trying to, you know, pick up the food to eat it, but he's a ghost. So like he's trying to pick up the food, but because he's a ghost, that food like, goes through his hands how could casper pick it up the ghost right. is like does he materialize and then he dematerializes it's a bunch of philosophers have said this is such a difficult problem you can't have 
interaction, causal interaction across ontological categories. Like you're just talking about two separate things. There's no mechanism of interaction. This has been a traditional position. This was this was even uh, a criticism of Descartes' philosophy back in like the 17th century. Mm -hmm. um, and he didn't really come up with a good answer. So anyway, it, your point, your your interest in this also ports, is, is uh, mirrored by my interest on this. And it goes very deep down to like the fundamentals of metaphysics. And um, I messaged you because after I listened to your lecture, I thought, well, I happen to, I think I have a plausible enough answer to the interaction problem where you can sort of, you can kind of get some solid intuitions about um, how a system could work where you have effective interaction across different ontological categories, even if you don't have like direct interaction. Okay, great. So let me just connect it more to, you know, uh, human action, Austrian economics, where just so we don't lose people like, ah, why do I want to, because it really is really fundamental, all this stuff. Before I forget the little bit, just on the ghost thing, right, it's, so folks, part of it is, if you just think it through, like, the ghosts can walk through walls and stuff, but then how do they knock your bookshelf over? Yeah. Right, right? like, it's kind of a, the weird, <laughs> like, that they seem to be, have uh, that ability, um, they're, they're intangible when they need to be or something like that. Right. So it's, it's interesting. Um, okay. So, and I, I don't know that I would have, it would have jumped out at me from human action had I not read Hoppe's, um, what is it? Economic science and the Austrian method. I think that's what it's mm -hmm. called. And, uh, and he was going through with like the synthetic a priori and all that Kantian stuff. But he early on said, Mises in the action axiom, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, this is not an exact quote from Hoppe, but you know, he merged mind and body. And so he didn't say he solved the mind body problem, but that's, he certainly, it, it, it takes it head on. And because so just, again, folks, just make, I just want to make sure on the one hand, this is so obvious and glib that you might just not even catch it. Like how much philosophical stuff is going on under the hood when you just say, oh yeah, humans act or, or a, a man acts, mm -hmm. there's a lot packed into that, that you're observing matter in motion, you know, the cells of this guy's body or whatever. But to say that that's action, you're attributing, you're saying, oh, that there's a, an ego involved, that it, this thing has intentions or desires, and it also has some form of reason in the sense it believes there's a cause and effect relationship. So the example I gave the talk is I had a bottle of water and I picked it up and you know, pantomime that I was taking a swig from it. And I said, if, if you look at that and say, oh, he did that because he's thirsty, like there's a whole heck of a lot packed into there. Yes. Namely that there's something going, you know, like if you saw a rock fall, you wouldn't say, oh, it, or, or if you saw a waterfall, you don't say that, oh, the ground's thirsty. That's how I interpret what's going on here. That's a commentary that doesn't make any sense, right? Right. Not only is that not correct, but people would say that's unscientific per se to talk like that in that realm. But right. yet you see a homo sapien member, you know, doing that, you could say, oh, he's thirsty. And so it, for one thing that there's something, you know, just like you int through introspection, think that you're conscious and you have desires, you're attributing that to me. You also assume that I know that water quenches thirst, right? That, you know, if I, if I were taking a bunch of sand and put it in my mouth, you wouldn't say, oh, because he's thirsty. That wouldn't make any sense. Right. Or if you did, you'd say he's thirsty and he's incorrect in his view as to what quenches thirst. You could go that route if you wanted to. Um, and, then, and then also that I have the ability to control my hand. And even right there, so this is, I'll stop on this one, Steve, and turn it back. But, and I, you know, I, it's a good laugh line. I get this in various crowd, but I say, if I, without context, without prodding you, if I told you I can control matter with my mind, you would say, get out of here. No, you can't. That's, that's unscientific. That's voodoo stuff. And then I go, look at, watch, tell me when to open, tell me when you want these fingers to open. And then they say, and then I go, and I do that. And I'm like, see, yeah, right. my, uh, uh, AI control, the camera's getting, I just did something that I triggered <laughs> it. <laughs> um, and so, and I said, look at, I'm controlling it with my mind. That's crazy. Right. And so like, aha, but I mean, it actually is right yeah. but it's not that you can lift up a boulder with your mind unless you're luke skywalker or something right so there is this weird thing where we think oh yeah you can't control matter with your mind except for all the this you know subset of reality where that's so commonplace we don't even notice it when like no that's actually 
if this weren't commonplace and someone came along and did it, that would be considered a miracle or he's a magician or right. he, there's some trick involved. How is he doing that? So anyway, that's just, so notice again that the action axiom, and this was the point that Hoppe was making, Mises is, even though the, some people might say, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever, let's let's get the economics. Like, no, he's doing something pretty profound there, merging the subjective mental realm of desires and preferences and what have you with ob, you know, objective external material reality, if you want to use that that term. Okay, so back to you. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, there's a there's a ton there, so I appreciate the glibness of like a moving mm -hmm. matter with my mm -hmm. with my mind. If it weren't so commonplace, it would mm -hmm. seem mir miraculous. True, yeah. uh, there are other examples of this that are even more sciency, right? Because you think of meditation, and it is an undeniable fact that people across the world have the ability to deliberately. I mean, I'm using these words, I put all of them in, in with air quotes, focus their minds, mm -hmm. focus their consciousness on some aspect of their sensation. And then by doing so, it changes their physiology. It changes their heart rate. It changes how their immune system reacts to things. Mm -hmm. You know, it changes their breath cycles. So it appears everywhere that we have at least causality going from mind to body, which is remarkable. And then it also is, self-evident that there is causal there's causality going from body to mind so you know if you um you know stub your toe that's it's clear that there's a change in your body state that mm -hmm. brings about a change in your mental state or if you get in a car crash heaven forbid and something happens to your brain it appears that your conscious you know even your personality might change mm -hmm. not just your conscious experiences so it it, it appears that there is it, I, I have not found a way to satisfactorily get rid of two-way causality between mind and body and also i want to say it's very tempting to be like oh well, what the mind is it's the brain you are fundamentally your, your consciousness or whatever is your brain but there's a there's a problem here and let me you know try to articulate what it is if we were to describe all of the phenomena that's happening in my brain every single brain state all of the electricity all of the chemicals and we had a material atomic description of the brain state we're still missing out on some additional piece of information which is the mental state which is how does the how does it feel when when there is a, a homo sapien which is uh has the a brain state a particular way what is the conscious experience like so for example, if I'm listening to music and you're trying to describe the, the entire phenomenon of listening to music as electricity in the brain, you're missing something, which is mm -hmm. the experience of listening to the music, the, 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 you know, what it feels like on the inside, you know, it's the subjective experience of listening to music. So, so it, we, it's tempting to try to collapse the experiential down to the, the, uh, you know, the third person. But I think we're always missing information there, so that which would which would point to perhaps a real deep metaphysical distinction between mind, mental stuff, and body, the physical stuff. Right, and it's uh, it, and I just confess when I, it's funny how this stuff, depending on your other views, how it colors the what what you think about something. So I know when I was an atheist, and for example, read some C.S. Lewis you know, those little booklets that he's got, you know, whether it's mere Christianity or the problem of pain or some of the other ones. And I just was totally unconvinced. And the, no, these are ridiculous. This is third grade arguments. How could anyone believe this stuff? And then once I independently became a Christian and went back and reread, wow, C.S. Lewis got a lot more profound <laughs> in the last 10 years. <laughs> um, and so likewise here, the, yeah, I remember when I was going through undergrad and I, it was this, the period of my life when I referred to myself as a devout atheist, ha ha. Um, and yeah, I took a lot of like philosophy of mind classes, cognitive science, things like that. And yeah, with all these, and I just thought it was so goofy and I don't care what, what red feels like or looks like, right. you know what I mean? It's just wavelengths of light and blah, blah, blah. blah. But yet there is a, a thing where again, you just, it's colloquial as if somebody was born blind and you tried to get across to them, what's the difference between red and purple? Like, yeah, you could talk about the wavelength, the frequency, well, blah, 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 but how, you know, there's no way that you could get that across. And yet that's a real thing. You know, what's fascinating. Sorry to interrupt you, Bob. Um, 
this is this is such a, a common example that you've given a philosophical mm -hmm. example of somebody that's blind from birth or deaf from birth birth with youtube and with the internet now we actually have a bunch of interviews of people who are in those circumstances of being blind from birth and it's exactly as you describe mm -hmm. where they'll they'll say look people ask me all the time you know they're trying to describe colors and they're like i have no idea what they're talking about i, I right. recall there was one guy who said you know, if somebody has a flashlight and they put it next to my eye, then I can sort of experience, you know, lightness or darkness. Like mm -hmm. there's, I can, I have some, it's not like total blindness as in 99.9, whatever percent blindness, but there was no conceptual understanding of color at all, mm -hmm. which is just, you know, it's just so fascinating. I, I figured, I thought I had to interject. Well, and I, re did you see the movie? Uh, what the heck was the name of that movie? It was Cher and then she had their, was it Rocky Dennis? I think it was mask. Nope. That was the name of the movie. Do you know what I'm talking about? Steve? No, uh -uh. I think I'm a bit older than you. Anyway, it was a big movie, I think in the eighties and it was a dramatic role for Cher, the, you know, the singer and, and she has this kid and he's got like a, a bone deformity or so he's like his face. He's not an attractive person to look at like his face. It's, it's like the story. It's like elephant man story kind of thing. Except it was like a kid mm -hmm. that was born mm -hmm. in the United States. I don't know if it was based on a true story or if it was just totally fiction, but in any event, he ends up, he, you know, he's, you know, it's classic movie of, oh, he's got a great personality, but he's got this face that scares people off. And then, so he ends up dating a blind girl. And then everyone, it's like awkward when new people meet them. Cause they're like, do we tell the girl, do you know, your boyfriend's really ugly? <laughs> so anyway, where it's like, oh, but she's the one kind of person that wouldn't bother, you know, whatever. But anyway, there's a scene where he's, trying to get her to understand color and he like lets her hold something hot and says that's red and then they and it's funny mm -hmm. you know and, and oh and she gets it it's a but i'm like because i was you know knew a lot of physics i was like well no actually the you know so if something hotter something is like it would be blue you know the light would turn blue <laughs> you know so right right red is actually a low frequency anyway but oh, okay i, I go got ahead. to keep back on that so um yeah I've had these types of conversations with a lot of people throughout the years, and there's a there's a also a category of people who are not uh, blind or deaf, but there's something I I don't I've encountered several times. In fact, a, a couple of people who I really have a lot of respect for that just absolutely bewilders me when I come across it, and it's when talking about mind itself or consciousness itself. Some people say they genuinely don't know what I'm talking about, even after extended conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I find this, I don't believe that they're mindless. It's just, I think for some, some people they have, I don't know, thought patterns or brain patterns or something, which sort of somehow prevent them from even recognizing that, you know, conscious experience is taking place there. And th this is totally bewildering to me. I don't know. I, I was talking with one gentleman and he mm -hmm. said, and th there was a particular word that I used and he was like, okay, maybe there's something there. There's there. And I, it was, um, it was feeling the feeling mm -hmm. of something. He said experience didn't do it. You know, the word experience didn't do it. The word consciousness, subjectivity, mm -hmm. these things didn't do it for whatever. The idea of feeling, he's like, okay, maybe that's some aspect, additional aspect than the, you know, than the atoms. So I don't really know what's going on there, but I would imagine there's probably people in the audience as well who are like, I don't even know what you're talking about when you're using the term mind or, or experience. Are they NPCs? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't want to make a claim there, but <laughs> that's how they would talk, right? Yeah. Um, so, right. So it, now are you, I'm a curious, you're saying yeah. you thought it was in good faith. It wasn't just like that the, the person had, or these people had a certain view um, that then just prevented them from even going down that path because they knew, you well, know, I all this, this way leads to dualism. And I know I'm not a dualist. So therefore this is all gobbledygook. I kind of scientific. think it's both. I think it's mm -hmm. in, it's a, it's a good faith. Uh, so I'm thinking of two examples in particular, people who are very bright who in good faith maybe have uh, very rigid patterns of thought that they're like, okay, this is the correct way of reasoning. These are the metaphysical assumptions I'm going to allow. Maybe some of the stuff is subconscious or whatever. And so when they start hearing mind and consciousness, it sounds woo woo. And they just immediately go, no, we can't talk about it. that. Can't be right. Like that mm -hmm. can't be theoretically mm -hmm. correct. But yeah, I, I, the two that stick out to me were, you know, conversations in good faith of people saying, yeah. I really, I'm not even sure this mind thing is out there. And there's I mean, a, is it an is it analogous to I don't know if you've seen it where how there was a thing it makes the rounds every once in a while about whether you have an internal monologue. Yeah, and some yeah. people are like, "What are you talking about?" And, yeah, right. And it could be something like, like, "How that. could you not? What do you mean you don't hear yourself think? What are you talking about?" You know, right, right. <laughs> how do you survive? How are you still standing here? 
<laughs> yeah, and that and it's that's kind of bewildering. But the idea that people don't have I don't know feelings or like sensory ex direct sensory experiences, this would be wild. I do want to just kind of um, uh, uh, contradict everything that I've said here, or like okay, or, or, okay. So you'll appreciate this. This your audience will appreciate this as a you know you talk about Christianity a lot. This is the exact uh, circumstance I found myself in prior to the experience of love. Because mm -hmm. I would, I'd heard people talk about love, and I thought I had sort of an idea of what it was. Mm -hmm. But then after the experience of love, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. There's this other thing. It's a shame that okay. it's called love. We don't have uh -huh. the word. But like, I know most people haven't experienced this. Because if they did, their lives would be totally changed. They would be completely reoriented. They would have different, you know, set of values. They would be open to wild or metaphysical ideas. There's, it appears that maybe there's some divine coordination going on. It's such a wild experience. And it's not going to make any sense if you haven't had it. It's like, I don't think you can rationally uh -huh. you know, deduce an understanding of what some people who are, who are Christians or other, maybe other religions are talking about when they're talking about divine love. So there's that. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know that I've ever said this publicly, but yeah, there was a period in grad school. So, and this was all jumbled and I've told the story in several places, I think to you as well, Steve, uh, like how did I go from being an atheist to a Christian again? For, so for, if you're, listening to this and you know if you've known me for a while and in your mind like oh yeah bob's a christian like that's normal to you i cannot stress enough how kids who knew me in undergrad in college when they heard bob murphy's a christian they were like their jaws dropped because <laughs> i was i mean i was still quote a nice guy back then you know what i mean but like you'd you know let me babysit your you know little niece or something but it was not you know i i was just very rational and we go no i mean the bible i i believe you know you I would do all kinds of, you know, you, you don't believe in Zeus, right? Well, by the same token, yeah, right. I don't believe in, you know, Yahweh, da, 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 right? So right. anyway, but, but so in grad schools, when all this stuff in part around all that time was, yeah, I fell in love and I, and I, cause I hit, and it was the same thing. Like I had had crushes before then, but once it happened, I was like, oh, this is what everybody's talking about. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I remembered, I think it was C.S. Lewis one time had a throwaway line about, like really awful things. And he said, like, as bad as unrequited love. And he mm -hmm. was putting it in the category of like, you'd rather be tortured, like mm -hmm. in a POW can And at the time I was like, what are you talking about? And then I was like, oh, that's what he meant. I get it now. And it's like, oh, air supply songs. I totally get them now. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, it was a, uh, that, yeah, I realized that, okay, yep. And it was the kind of thing where if you're not sure if you've ever been in love, then you haven't been like you right. when that smacks you. So anyway, right. and we'll, and we should just say on to close that thread out. Everything you just said and what I just said mm -hmm. is not actually a, 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 an argument to get somebody to believe something. It's more of a statement. It's a, like a statement of an unfortunate, weird fact that there that apparently some information is only discoverable through experience. You know, and mm -hmm. I hate that as somebody who's more rationally oriented. I want to know as much as I can. Mm -hmm. prior to experience a priori right but uh there are some uh, uh, there are some very important facts that i just don't think you can deduce yourself to they just have to discover them through experience okay so anyway. where should we go i mean is it time i mean i have my quick th th maybe because i want to you know put the spotlight on yours why don't i give my quick theater analogy yeah and then you can critique yeah, yeah. it or whatever you want to do react to it sure. and then you can you know take time and develop your arguments for the jury um so my quick thing with trying to explain that yes it, it does seem as if we you know, we're viewing the unfolding of events in this physical material universe we can zoom in and see that there are laws of physics that you know see and i think at some level you know, if you zoomed in on my cells and my body, you wouldn't notice anything like, oh, and that's where Bob Murphy's free will kicked in because normally the cell should have done this, but instead, and you know, as you push this stuff, people would think, well, it's probably not going to be in your liver. Like if something's going on, the action is going to be in your nervous system somehow. And it, and it, you know, and it, right now, like to kind of go back to what Mises was saying, there's this veil of ignorance that it's so complex that we really can't you know, and Mises allowed for, you know, maybe down the road at some point, it's where they're going to be able to tell and they can look at the state of someone's molecules at time T, T1, and then predict with near certainty what's going to look like at T2. And so we won't have to refer to 
intangible preference scales or whatever to explain the behavior of this clump of cells. But for, you know, so that was the deal. But I, I do think in principle, you got down, and even if you bring in quantum stuff that still doesn't get around the problem, then okay, if it's random, it's random. It's not that, oh, it's not really random. It's your free will is what's causing it to, you know, the electron to pop over here. Like that, that's not consistent with, you know, standard uh, quantum physics theories or interpretations, whatever. So anyway, my attempt to resolve that, that relies on there being a creator, God, is to say real quick, I, I'll, do, I'll do it fast. Imagine you're a movie theater and you're watching this film and then you see this red dot on the screen. You're like, oh, some Joker's got a laser pointer, ha. Huh? And you're and you notice though, you're looking at it that as you move your eyes around, the dot just seems to be tracking your line of sight. And at first you just think it's a coincidence, but then you're sitting there and 30 seconds into it, if this thing is perfectly tracking wherever you look on the screen, you start to get, you know, it's freaking you out a little bit. Like, well, how is this? And you're like wondering, are there cameras around the theater that are looking at my eyes and somehow calibrating where and it's freaking you out. And like, you know, after 10 minutes, you would like probably think the CIA was in the room or something, right? You'd be freaking out. And then what if it turned out later that no, like you did investigations and you realized that no, that was a normal film. There weren't, you know, cameras in there tracking your, the muscles in your eyes or anything. And it was just the people who made that film perfectly predicted. They knew where you were going to be sitting and they knew exactly where you were going to look down to the hundredth of a second and they knew where to have the red dot on there, but that red dot was no more, it, it, was, it wasn't special. There was nothing different about that red dot than any, any other pixels or whatever, you know, on the, on the film. And it just appeared that way, but it was normal. Like to explain why was that red dot, you would use the same, you know, oh, photons came out of the projector and bounced off and hit your eyeball and blah, blah, blah. And so then the question would be, who is controlling the movement of that red dot? And so on one layer of explanation, you would say the people who made the film, you know, they clearly did it or then, you know, the laws of physics, you know, the photons and whatever, who would have nothing to do with the guy sitting in this in the theater. But on another level, you would say the guy sitting there in a sense controlled where the dot moved because the designers took into account his free choices of where he pointed his eyeballs. And OK, so if you get that, then that's kind of my analogy for if there is no, you know, no physical universe. There's a, a, an omnipotent, omniscient God, and he decides to create the material universe and the laws of physics and everything. You, just looking at the material realm, you can see the transition and how, you know, the state of the universe at time T1 has something to do with the state at T2. And there's very simple mechanical laws that describe the unfolding of that, you know, the behavior of those material particles or whatever. But then there seems to be this other realm of conscious experience that we're quote watching the movie and so i'm saying is it possible that in some sense god decides to create that instantiate that particular universe out of all the possible ones and creates the beings with genuine free will out of other possible things he could have done because he perfectly anticipates ah given the scenario and how they're where they're going to find themselves you know this little portion of the timeline they're going to freely choose to do all this string of action and I'm going to orchestrate everything so that everybody watching this film believes they have some influence in what happens, even though in some sense they don't, but in another important sense they do. Cause I took into account their free decisions when I designed the laws of physics, blah, 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 blah. So that's kind of my attempt to reconcile this. Yeah. I, I like, I like this idea. I mean, I think, uh, I think that, I think that works conceptually, mm -hmm. at least. I don't think there are any inherent paradoxes that come out of that. And um, when we had a brief conversation about this um, before, you you uh, describe you sent me a link to a talk before where you just you gave mm -hmm. that example. And immediately, what came to mind was um, Leibniz. Leibniz mm -hmm. has a very similar idea, um, where essentially uh, the fundamental constituents of um, the universe are what he calls monads which you could sort of think of as like a, an indivisible soul or maybe like a perspective or your own internal world or something. Um, and it appears, it only appears as if um, monads can affect the state of other monads, but really there was a, to use his term, a pre-established harmony mm -hmm. between the things that are happening in one monad and the things that are happening in another monad. So a, a way, we, like in our modern language, we would say something like, you know, the the dance that is taking place between our minds and the world are all pre-programmed by God mm -hmm. to make it look mm -hmm. like there is 
interaction when there isn't actually fundamentally interaction. So that sounds very similar to what you were Yeah, so let me yeah, mention, so thank you, that, the, uh, so this, and then it's also related, my, my view is, especially if you get in more into the um, reconciling God's sovereignty with human free will or whatever, that um, it's what's called Molinism. And, and so I, somebody told me years ago when I first did that theater analogy and then tried to relate to Christian, you know, standard Christianity, someone said, Bob, you should go check out uh, Molina's work. And I did, I was like, oh yeah, that, that is, there is a superficial, at least similarity there between, and then, yeah, it was only more recently with Leibniz that I went and looked it up and I was like, oh yeah, I'm basically just reinventing the wheel that this is, so I'm not saying I agree with everything he did, but I, I do see like what you're saying, Steve, that the more I was looking into it. So I believe it was an independent discovery. Like I certainly didn't know yeah, about yeah. Molinism and I think all I knew about Leibniz was, oh, he and Newton argued over who invented calculus or discovered it, depending on what verb you want to use. And I vaguely remembered that, oh yeah, he was the, you know, the, the Dr. Pangloss inspiration in right. Candide. Right. And, and I, and also then once I realized, oh, wait a minute, there's a, been a grave injustice. And I went back and reviewed it. I was like, no, I am a Panglossian now, <laughs> like given what I just said, if that's the way it works and God considers every possible universe that he could create, well, why wouldn't he pick the best one? Or rather, yeah, of course, the one he picked is the best one. If you're a Christian, like that would, would it mean to say God picked it in fear? You know what I mean? So anyway, right. um, I'll, I'll stop there, but the, yeah, I, I realized like I, I was mad at Voltaire. Like, I, and I was mad at my English teacher, you know, for like, oh yeah, there's this idiot. And I was like, what, Pank, you think the best of all possible? Doesn't he know about cancer? Yes, yes, right. uh, Leibniz did, well, I don't know if he knew about cancer, but he knew about sickness and death. Yeah, I had years ago, um, I made up a list uh, for myself of, of like important books that I need to read and mm. Candide from Voltaire was on there. And, I, you know, when you, I don't know, listen to how people talk about Voltaire and they're like, oh, you're so brilliant. This is so great. And I thought, okay, well, Candide is really small. I'll give it a go. And I thought, oh, this guy was dumb. Like he, he didn't act. I don't even think he understood the depth of the ideas that he was mocking. And I was also thinking... The lap, there's like two funny parts in there, but it's kind of silly. It's like a very childish, like adolescent attempt at satirizing an idea that a guy didn't understand. So mm -hmm. I was also very, I had very high hopes that I was going to read the great Voltaire. And I haven't read any, really any of his other work other than Candide, but it, it just turned me off mm -hmm. so much. I was like, ah, oh, forget this guy. Well, let, I have to say this now. So <laughs> when, when I was like, uh, you know, this bug was... What metaphor do I want to bug up my, well, anyway. <laughs> so when I was excited to, to get it back into this, like this is, I don't know, about a month ago when you and I first started, you know, chit-chat, whatever, and I was all in this Leibniz terror for like five days going and absorbing everything. I didn't actually go read his stuff. I'm talking, you know, watching YouTube lectures naturally, and things. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it wasn't like getting out of hand here. No. I, uh, and I found some thing where, I don't know if it was AI generated or if it was old school, you know, human, but it was like a, like a, a a rhyming you know a poetic it was it wasn't a rap battle but it was more poetic like going mm -hmm. back and like here's uh Leibniz's views and then here's you know Voltaire's critique kind of blah blah, blah. and then you know the guy ended sort of ironically saying and of course though what uh Leibniz would have to would agree is the uh the perhaps unfair treatment at the hands of Voltaire where now most people know of Leibniz's views only through the prism of being mocked with this, you know, caricature in, in, in uh, Candide, you know, that also is part of the best of all possible worlds. But I realize, yes, it is because now that I, and, you know, perhaps others that will rekindle the flame, I don't need to explain to you what it is. I can just say, remember Dr. Pangloss? And they can yeah. go, yeah. And I go, that's what I'm talking about. He was right. <laughs> so tell me why he was wrong. If yeah, you're a Christian yeah. and they're like, oh yeah. So Voltaire really did, you know, he kept it a lot and, and popularized it to everybody. That's a nice. And now all I have to do is just, and so, yes, this is the best of all possible worlds. And Leibniz should sleep soundly in peace, knowing thank you, Voltaire, for telling the world about my idea. I like that take. That's a good take. And, mm -hmm. and uh, not to go too d deep down the, the Leibniz um, uh, rabbit hole here, but he's he should also come up more, I hope, in contemporary thought because some of his work... Uh, um, is relevant to AI. Like his work was relevant to computation generally. Like he created mm -hmm. mechanical computers and stuff. And he had this idea. So we we take calculators for granted that like calculators are mechanically manipulating numbers. 
Mm -hmm. in this way that gives you like correct outputs and we just think yeah okay whatever that's a really amazing idea to be able to do that mechanically he sort of thought from my understanding that you could do this but with concepts that there was some some logical structure to our concepts and to our reasoning that you could sort of mechanize it and get good outputs you could i think what did he call it, it was like the reasoning machine or whatever as a general mm -hmm. general reasoning machine and ai at, at present is not actually that far away from what he was kind of uh hoping we could get to it's like way more sophisticated i think than he under would have understood it to be but mm -hmm. by by figuring out logical structures in our language we do sort of have the ability to do this mechanical reasoning machine now with ai that's pretty cool i also mentioned before i should I should say this is this is the book i told you it's not i exaggerated it's not 800 pages it's 600 pages but the font is really small and uh -huh. i'm in this one and i do think um this so I don't like the term genius. I think that word doesn't describe much uh, much anymore in the world. This guy would qualify as a genius. Polymath on multiple domains, um, mm -hmm. except I think he went off the tracks with regards to infinity and infinitesimals, but the, yeah, we're not, we're not going to get into, into that one. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely when you were describing your thought experiment in the theater, I was thinking, oh yeah, this is Leibniz and... Uh, there's a lot of meat there. I think we should resurrect Leibniz maybe from mm -hmm. the grave a bit. And even... We we don't need to go down this rabbit hole, but even there, I think I made a almost joke to you when we were going back and forth, you know, on, on the Twitter DMs or whatever on this stuff. But I think I there was something where I thought maybe that's the way to bridge the two. Like, yeah, the material physical world is finite. Like, yeah, there's a, there's a, in principle there's a smallest unit of length beyond which you can't push things or because it, it, you know the laws of physics break down and blah blah blah. And that maybe what, you know, with Leibniz, it was like, oh, yes. And so if you take the limit as it goes to zero, then that's the spirit realm or the where the monads yeah. kick in or what, what you know what yeah. I mean? Like maybe he there is like something. That. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I utterly, I, I have, I, I despise that. You know, every, every, every bit of my DNA is like, oh, what a terrible idea. But I do think Leibniz might think that's a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you're right. In terms of genius, like just to say that, oh yeah, he was in a turf war with Isaac Newton about who invented calculus. I mean, that's kind of, you know, that's, that's good street cred. So right. You know, exactly. Amongst my other work is, yeah, I was arguing with Newton about who invented uh, calculus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he has a huge uh, uh, amount of literature out there. Apparently, a lot of which hasn't even been um, translated. So a lot of it is like in notes and stuff. So there's like researchers right now that are still putting, they're still finding new content of Leibniz. But I want to, so I'll, this is a good a segue to give mm -hmm. you my own take. We've got your take. We've got a little bit of Leibniz take. Mm -hmm. I want to give you my own take because I, I have a theory here that I call a theory of indirect interaction that gives a little bit more bite in my opinion, because it preserves a real type of causality um, that I think the pre-established harmony doesn't quite, right. it doesn't quite give us. So um, I'm going to share my screen and then maybe we can get into this little sure presentation. Thing. And yeah, so go ahead and, and pull it out and I'll, I'll do it. But yeah, you, what you're saying is it's my thing, I think is very good at the one way causal of like how we as the observers the conscious entities can like take in stuff um and then you know and, and, it, and it gives the illusion that we're controlling things out there but yet yeah how is it that the things out there can affect us that that's right. still a little bit like there must be laws in the spirit realm too affecting your conscious state at time zero and what makes it turn into you know and it's yeah, right, so then right. you realize like oh gee am i really getting out of anything or is there an explanatory power here or am i just creating a whole nother universe that i don't know how to explain so right right um, so let me give you a little bit of um, just a little bit of framing here, and then I'll work through the examples. Um, so this is a theory that preserves causal power between um, ontological or among um, ontological categories. And as we'll see at the end, um, you can have as many ontological categories as you want. If you want to be a dualist and say it's just, you know, the world is fundamentally mind and matter, that works. If you want to be a pluralist and say it's mind, matter, and abstract stuff, that works. If you want to say it's mind, matter, abstract stuff, maybe spiritual stuff and arbitrarily other many categories, this preserves, this would be a mechanism to preserve some sort of interaction between them. Um, and then I'll try to go through and hit some of the, the main like objections and the way that philosophers have been framing things. And I think this answers a bunch of questions. So, okay. Okay. So this is, um, I sent you an article that this, uh, that, that this really should have been in a few years ago when I wrote the article, but I came up with this in preparation for this talk because I think it would be very helpful to see visually 
um, how this might work. Okay. And just for the benefit of people who are like in their car and they're listening to the audio, yeah. can you also narrate to the extent possible? I will try and I'm probably going to fail on that. So we're just going to it, say it'll be like trying to explain to Helen Keller what's red. Yeah, right. Ahead. Exactly. Um, and I hope Helen Keller's not driving right now because, you know, that's probably not a good situation. <laughs> um, okay. So I like to, so th th this is framed um, from this article that I sent you. It's called, uh, I, I have a different couple, a couple of different titles for it, but I think the one I sent you is on Substack. It's called How Mind Body Dualism Might Work. So if you want to read the, like, the full article here, that might be helpful. Yeah, um, and but, I'll link to all this stuff, obviously, folks. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So, I think it's helpful to just establish before we talk about interaction across multiple ontological categories, just to talk about physical motion and like how physical motion um, can be analyzed. I'm not saying this is the way the world works. I'm just saying if you follow along and you like this analytical description of how you know, physical motion works, then it's going to help us solve, I think, the mind-body problem. Okay, so this would be an example here of physical motion. This is just, uh, you know, a grid. And on the grid, there's a three by three, I'm going to call it a ball, um, because it's in discrete space. So it looks like a square, Bob, but it's actually there, there are, you know, there aren't any circles or any, any crazy such objects. So that's actually a ball in space. It's just a 2D grid in state one. Okay. State two is the ball moving one uh, quadrant, one square um, uh, to the right. State three, is it moving one more um, uh, chunk to the right? So this is like ultra elementary way of thinking about a ball moving through space or mm -hmm. something moving through space. You and for space. the benefit of audio listeners, it's he's got a grid and then some of them are colored in and then he's just changing which one, just like the pixels on a TV screen changing to give the appearance of motion. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what it is. It's, this would be like a pixel theory of physical motion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a natural question that we can ask, even with this like elementary model, which is why would state two follow from state one? So another way of saying this is, you know, you imagine uh, the start, the, the, the starting state of a physical system. Why is it not that the second state that progresses is totally chaotic? So in the article, I say, you know, why if we're describing the motion of billiards on the pool table, is it not? Why do we not say, you know, the, the cue ball struck the um, the eight ball and then the eight ball started orbiting Jupiter or something crazy and chaotic? We say, well, no, there, there's some sort of constraint whereby state two follows in some real causally constricted way from state one. So that the previous state determines, if you will, what the future state is. So I think an, a good answer to the question, why does state two fall from state one is this. Well, there are laws of motion and the mm -hmm. laws of motion govern how the states progress. Yes, very yeah. natural, intuitive way mm -hmm. of, of thinking about this. Okay, but then we go a little bit deeper and we say, okay, law. there are laws of motion. How? What is a law of motion? I, wanna go, I don't wanna get too deep into the, the weeds of this question, but some people want to say a law of motion, it's really just describing the patterns that we observe. There's no such thing as a law you know, out there. It's just a way of describing that we observe there are patterns of motion and so we call them laws. I think that view doesn't work, but for, uh, I'm not gonna, you know, we're not gonna go into that, but let's just say for this um, analysis, there, when we say there are laws of motion, we're talking about a real thing. Like there are things out there that are laws which actually govern the behavior of objects. Okay, so I'm going to say then, uh, you know, next slide here is um, imagine that there is a universal function, I'm going to call it, that sort of sits on top of uh, everything that exists. And mm -hmm. what I mean by universal function is it's just turning inputs into outputs. Mm -hmm. You could, if you want to use a computer analogy, you can think of it like it's like a CPU that is changing input input states into output states. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say the laws of physics are within the universal function. So if if it's easier to conceptualize, you can just think okay, when, it, when you think laws of physics, think universal function that sort of sits above or governs the lower level of phenomena. Okay, so. What if this is how physical motion works? You've got a physical object, and it's not, there's nothing within the physical object itself that determines its future state. 
Um, if I, I think it's helpful to reduce physical objects fundamentally down to like blocks of geometry. So there's nothing within the geometry itself which says things have to progress this way, uh, this way or that way. So what if it's that there is information about the physical state that is put into the universal function and there's the information about the physical state that the universal function then uses to generate the next output state. So if you think again, think in terms of computation, the underlying physical system is an input mm -hmm. or, or to be more specific, the underlying physical system is the, uh, gives you the information that is used as an input that then is uh, put into the function so that the next state is generated. And then that next state, state two, is itself used as an input or information is put back into the universal function and out of uh, you know, the next cycle, we have state three. So you have, you know, the physical world is uh, a geometric structure. There's information about that geometric structure that goes into the universal function and is the information which determines the, the um, next state. Now that might sound like to a torturous way to explain something very simple um, or, or, or elementary. I'm sort of describing how the computer works here. Mm -hmm. But in doing it this way, believe it or not, if, if we think of um, motion in this context, purely physical motion, I think this itself solves the mind-body problem. Can I stop for a second? Yes, absolutely. Is there any restriction in your framework here? Does the information have to be purely generated from the, the state? Or is there anything else that could be contributing to it? So that this is exactly where we're going to go. Okay. Um, yes. So there's a, there, a natural question we should talk about at the end is what is information? Okay. Uh, there's a couple of, of attempts at answering this. Um, but right now, let's just, we'll put that question aside till the end. Okay. And we'll say the, you know, it, I, I like to, I, I tried to put this in the slide or in the writing, but it doesn't work. But maybe in, in, in spoken language, it works better. I like to think of it as information about the state. It's the aboutness that is key mm. here. Um, and I'll explain why that's the case when we start talking about mental phenomena. That's information about the underlying state and not the underlying state itself. Okay, so all we have to do to uh, get us to a resolution of the mind-body problem is to say, okay, now imagine instead of the ball moving through the grid, we're talking about a physical system that just includes everything, including your brain structure, uh, you know, the environment around you, the chairs, all the geometry that's out there. Mm -hmm. We're going to say that we're taking that as the, the underlying physical state. That The information about that physical state put up into the universal function, and it outputs the, uh, the next physical state, and then also objects in different ontological categories. So now we're saying um, the system is not just outputting different states of geometry. It's outputting different states of geometry plus mental experiences. So in other words, this is outputting brain states and mind states. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this specific slide here, um, I don't know, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be good at, at de describing it, but this would be an example of epiphenomenalism or one-way causality from body to mind. So it's worth, it's worth pausing here for a moment. <clears throat> if we talk about um, you know, the experience of seeing particular colors, it's it has a, a great deal of explanatory power to say the reason that I'm seeing particular colors or having particular visual experiences is because of my brain state. You know, there are, I'm going to talk about, there are wavelengths, there are, you know, cones and rods in my eye. We'll talk about a, a bunch of complex stuff that's going on in my brain as a, uh, uh, at, at least a partial explanation, if not a satisfactory explanation for the contents of my experience. Mm -hmm. But we run into traditional problems like, okay, how, how or where in the brain do you get mental stuff outputted? Like um, John Searle, for example, uh, he has a line where he says, I think consciousness is secreted by the brain the same way that um, the liver secretes bile. Mm -hmm. In my view, this, that's just a category error. That, I, don't, right. I don't actually think I, that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. In this view, it's actually not anything within the brain that is creating consciousness. This is critical. There is nothing within the physical system or the, the, the facts of geometry as they are, which gets you to 
mental experiences. What it is, is the facts of geometry uh, being connected to information states that are then used in the universal function to generate the output state. So this is why the brain doesn't secrete consciousness, but it's why when you get brain damage, your consciousness is affected. It's not that like you have the consciousness gland, that's some physical thing that's squirting consciousness out. And so when you get damaged to it, it changes your conscious mm -hmm. experience. It's that when the physical structure gets damaged, the information gets damaged or the information changes. And so the information is no longer satisfactory to generate the same mental outputs. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So now all we got to do, now we're, now we're, we're nine-tenths there. All we got to do is say, ah, okay, instead of epiphenomenalism or one-way causality from body to mind, we say, what if the information going into the universal function is both mental and physical? So what if instead of the, just the, uh, the brain states or the information about the brain states being used to generate the output states, what if it's information about the brain state and the mental state that is being put into the universal function Mm -hmm. such that the next state of the universe, mental and physical, is generated. So in other words, <clears throat> on the question of whether or not Bob has the ability to you know, drink water on stage, what, what are the criteria necessary for Bob to drink water? Well, it's in this view, we could say he has to have the physical uh, uh, states correct, but he also has to have a mental state. He has to have a decision, let's say, to drink the water. There also, he also has to have, you know, maybe some particular sensory experience or whatever mental stuff you want to say is going on when you're drinking the water. We're going to say both the physical and the mental have to be there such that the correct information is put into the universal function to generate the output state of you drinking water. So this would be an example then of, uh, of call, effective causal interaction of mind and body then affecting mind and body. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the last piece of the puzzle then, uh, la last uh, set of slides I have here, is just taking this concept and making it even more general. So it's not just mind and body. Uh, we're going to say it's mind, body, and abstract stuff or the unknown unknown or spiritual stuff. It can literally be whatever state that the universe is in, in whatever ontological category. If there's information about that state, then it is the information about the state that's used in the universal function to generate the next output state of, of the, the mental state, the brain state, and maybe abstract states or information states or spiritual states or whatever. So one of the, one of the very nice things about this is it's super flexible because if you want on the, on the input side, if you want to say, you know, the, we humans have free will and there's like, there's like a bit, uh, there's a bit that we're flipping when we are, are making decisions and you can volitionally determine that bit. And in order to get a particular output the, you know, the bit that you're flipping with your mind has to be a one or a zero mm -hmm. that gives you some kind of causal mechanism for choice. You can say, oh, well, what's going on here when somebody is making a free decision? Well, they're flipping an, they're flipping an abstract bit or a mental bit such that, you know, they're getting a particular output. Oh, now, if you don't like that and you say, no, we don't have free will, we can't have free will, fine, you don't have to, this, this doesn't require it. You can have epiphenomenalism if you like. You can say it's just, it's material, uh, the, the, the information about the material is the fundamental information that determines all the other future output states. You do that too. So that's the, that's the idea. And um, I think that's a pretty good, you know, it gives us a pretty good intuition for how you could have effective interaction across multiple ontological categories it's not the it's not casper manifesting you know casper the friendly ghost like manifesting a physical hand that moves you know the thing that, that doesn't make any sense it's that you have information about a, a mind that is put into the universal function that then you know changes the next um the next output state okay what what role is saying information adding to it like couldn't you just say this is a function that it takes many arguments including like and you say what's the dimensions of the argument like in terms of computer programming and say oh the the first argument is the the state of the physical universe the second is the mental categories of an array of every conscious being the third is you know anything you want to put in there about math and blah blah blah, blah and that's what you feel why does it no no that's the wrong layer it's got to be the information about each of those things 
what is that word information doing? So um, it, it is getting us out of saying pure geometry. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to reduce the physical world. I think this is helpful to reduce the physical world down to, um, again, to use Cartesian language here, extension. He had this idea of like spatial extension, like there's the physical stuff has is spatially extended or it takes up space. Is another way of talking about it. And that is some essential fundamental aspect of the material world. Everything in the material world is fundamentally in space, of space, takes up space. And so by saying we're dealing with the relevant feature is the information, you're saying it is necessarily abstract or necessarily non-geometric. Because so, otherwise it doesn't work. If you want to say there's something about the geometry, there's something special in the facts of the geometry, just the sterile geometry itself, that doesn't get you enough. That doesn't, there's no explanation for why the geometry would have the power to, you know, you know, have any causal power at all. So you need the information as like an abstraction layer on top of the fundamental bits. Okay. I, uh, I guess wouldn't, couldn't, couldn't all that action be happening inside the universal function to speak loosely? That, that, that's, do you get what I'm saying? Like, it, it seems like, oh, before we feed this stuff into the function, we first got to run a filter on it and extract the information about it. And then we feed the information into the function. Okay. Yeah. You get what I'm, yes. trying, what I'm trying to get at? Yeah. So this is a good way of talking, you know, a good segue to talk about what information is and how it works. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we will use language that we're not supposed to use here, like awareness. So like, how okay. does the universal function become aware of informational inputs. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what you're asking, right? Like what's the, how do you go from the physical thing to the, to the universal function? And, and uh, so I don't know, I would say um, <clears throat> there's two, there's two possible answers here for how like inf how the information aspect works or what information is. Um, one of them I know you'll like a lot. Um, so one attempt does it to involve sushi. <laughs> um, no, I can't. Okay. Like, All right. I can't I find guessing. any way where it would evolve. Okay. Um, so the first would be, uh, this is just like an abstract system. So this would be, this would be, well, there's a platonic world out there and in the platonic world, there is information, there's abstract structures, there's the, whatever the CPU, this like universal CPU or function is, that is a, that is in the domain of Platonism of perfect forms. Um, I think that's, that might be true. Um, there's another possibility here, which is very tantalizing, which is to say that whole, the informational mechanism, the functional mechanism, you're sort of describing what God is doing. So, so God is aware of everything in creation or God, you know, has information about literally everything. Mm -hmm. God is actively outputting the universe. Mm -hmm. And so God automatically has all the information required to turn the system to the next state. Mm -hmm. And th this is an idea that's sometimes called like divine conceptualism, the idea that abstract stuff exists separate from our individual minds, mm -hmm. but it still exists within the mind of God. There's like abstract, you know, the, the, uh, to use it, I think uh, Bernardo Castro uses the term, the mind at large, the mind okay. out there, like the that. mind outside uh -huh. of our individual minds, uh -huh. God's mind. Mm -hmm. That's where this stuff is taking place. I think either, I think either is uh, acceptable in my mind. Okay, so, so you anticipate. I had two big questions. By the way, should we keep sharing the screen, or oh, right, should we? Right. Uh, I don't think. Unless you haven't. Do you have any question? Anything you want me to go back to? No. I. Okay. So I'll pull it yeah, out, and then if if we if we need to refer to that again, we can let me yeah, know. There and we I'll go. Cue it right. up again. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, my my two big questions were going to be, the first is I was going to say, is your framework falsifiable? Is there any, you know, or is it just like, well, no, just given if this is the way we're going to conceptualize things, it is what it is. And you either find it helpful or not, but it's not going to be right or wrong. Mm -hmm. um, there's that. What, and then I was going to say, is the universal function God, like, is it that he, it could be God or is it that, no, it has to be at least some type of God. So those are the two questions I was going to ask. Okay. So um, let me ask, answer the second one first. Mm -hmm. So if, imagine I were to ask you, how do the laws of physics control the behavior of physical objects? Like, how would you try to answer that? Okay, so it, on the first pass, I would say at one level, all we mean by talking about the laws of physics are the regularities that we have observed. And if it yeah. ever looked like something was violating it, we would just say, okay, we were wrong about what we okay. thought they were. Let, let, let's, let's walk down that path. Yeah. Okay, so let's say that the laws of physics for now are regularities that we observe. 
Okay, mm -hmm. then I have an additional question, which is why are there regular patterns at all? So like, why should, why isn't it the case that there is total chaos? So I would say, I think that there is a God and that it totally makes sense as to what, you know, that, that he, he wanted his creation to be intelligible. He gave us reason and so on. Um, I don't know what, if you weren't, if you didn't believe in God, I guess you could say, well, there's a, you'd have a multiverse thing and say, yeah, there's plenty of universe out there that are chaotic and life doesn't emerge in those. And so no one's looking around saying, how come everything's orderly? I guess that's the two possible answers. Yeah. I think, I think was what, what, it, what people want to do is they say, oh no, because the talking about laws of physics is kind of scary. If somebody's going to push you know, and be like, okay, what exactly is a law? Where is a law? Mm -hmm. What is it made of? How does it work? Um, People, I think it's tempting to retreat to say, well, no, that's just a description. It's just a description of nature. But if you, if we say it's just a description, we are literally left with no explanation for why there are regular patterns. Because it, we're not, not to ask the why question, I'm looking to say, well, why are there regular patterns? And it, you can't say there are regular patterns. You can't just say, well, just describing the patterns. There's an additional thing, which is like, why, why does nature cohere and glued together in a particular way? Mm. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Just let me answer more concretely in what I actually think the answer is, as opposed yeah. to me trying to deal with what would a, an atheist say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think I view it as every moment in the timeline, God, if you want to think creates a de novo, it's like those flip things, you know, when you were a kid, like, did you have like the little flip and you like would draw the, the cartoon characters? Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. you go, and it would look like a seat. But really, it was like each state you ind independently created yeah. each pain right. in the thing. Right, right. I think you could view it like that. So no, in, in principle, anything could happen. Like God's doing everything. Yeah. And he just makes it look like there's an orderliness and oh, like, or another analogy I use is Shakespeare writing an iambic pentameter. He wasn't forced to, he could have violated that, but it just made it his creation cooler that he yeah. like had all these constraints on it while he's still telling a story. So yeah, God wants to tell a story that we're fallen. We disobey him. He wins us back. He, dies for us and all this stuff. Oh, and by the way, all the constituents of this in terms of the physical matter obey these very simple rules just because I'm right. a show off. Look how awesome I am. That's yeah. kind of. Yeah. And I think in my opinion, at some point, mm -hmm. the atheistic and the theistic views sort of can merge here. I know this sounds weird. I think, but maybe I should say atheism, I think merges into pantheism at some point. Okay. So, uh, when, you, when you're when you talking about, like, why, you know, the universe should exist at all, and you take that as a serious question, I think atheists tend to say things like, well, you know, fundamentally, the essential aspects of the material world are eternal and, like, indestructible and timeless. And they, they talk about, when you, when they push, when you push them all the way to the end, they... They essentially say, well, okay, maybe the material world itself is divine or has divine attributes or something. So I mm -hmm, think it sort of mm -hmm. eventually gets pushed into pantheism. But I also think on this particular question, the platonic and the theistic are actually very similar to one another. So like you could, uh, if I didn't want to take a purely theistic perspective, I could say, mm -hmm. look, the operations of the mind of God, uh, I can talk about the operations of the abstract world and this universal like CPU that's generating the universe at every given moment, maybe it itself isn't a person, but it's still some like universal logos. Mm -hmm. It's still something you can't kill it. It's immortal. It's like uh, in some sense above the material world. It's transcendent. It mm -hmm. penetrates every aspect of like the material world. So I think we're going to sort of end up describing one way or another, a very similar uh, uh, concept here, either God or some mind at large, universal logos, universal computation thing behind it all. Okay. Did, I mean, I was, I was following what you were saying. I didn't disagree at any point, but you earlier, were you, I thought you were kind of like easing me into Bob. I think you're going to see if you go down that path, there's a, there's trouble, but is, is there not? Like oh. how you said the atheist turns into pantheism. Oh, no. Whereas no, like, I, don't I don't think Richard think Dawkins wants to be a pantheist. Whereas were you saying I, I, that the standard Christian ends up at a place that maybe you don't want to go? No, no, that? the opposite. Oh, no, okay. the, the opposite. I would say oh, okay. uh, what, what atheists like Dawkins will tend to do is they'll think they're terribly clever and they're like, 
you know, if you listen to the arguments of why is there something rather than nothing or like what's the end of the infinite regress or whatever, they end up saying something like, well, it's in, it is in nature's inherent structure that fundamentally it has properties that are eternal and like, mm -hmm. and they, and uh, immaterial or immortal or whatever. They, they end up stuffing in concepts into the atheism. So I, th I think, I guess <clears throat> that's a long way of saying if you are an atheist and you push the philosophical inquiry to its furthest point when you're asking like the most fundamental questions about ontology and existence, I think you end up a pantheist because you say, okay, we need somehow, we have to have an explanation for the world. Mm -hmm. We have to have to have an explanation. We have to answer the infinite regress somehow. And so either you attribute the divine properties to, you know, the material universe, or you attribute the divine properties to something that's sits above it, uh, you know, as a theist, but I think these are actually very close. Um, let me do, let me, cause you asked two questions and that mm -hmm. was, um, that was one of them you asked, is it's falsifiable? This is an yeah. interesting question. So I would like to say that this is just an analytical framework and, and what I, all I'm trying to do with this example is say, well, clearly we have one sort of intuitive way that we can answer the interaction problem. So given that the historical objection to dualism and can, can I stop dualism, you one second, Steve? Sure. I sure. just want to make sure the listener understands what I was doing with that question. So let me just quick just flip over to it. Like from yeah. economics. Yeah. A lot of times people would pop off and you know, like the critics would come in and like, oh yeah. And using their out outmoded or outdated theories or obsolete theories of supply and demand. And I would say, no, that's a category error. Yeah. Supply and demand are not theories. It's a framework to explain market prices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it doesn't make, it's not, is it right or wrong? It is what it, you know, it's a way of analyzing it and it might be not helpful. You know, maybe that's not a good way to organize your thoughts, but it doesn't even make sense to say this theory of supply and demand or, you know, would the data contradict supplier demand? Okay. So that's the sense in which, right. you, so yeah, now, so if you don't mind like just restarting your answer. So the, I, mean, I always want the listener to get what was I doing with that question? So that's what I'm asking right. you. Is this just a framework to think about it that, of course it's correct you know it's, it's just it's a way of thinking about it it is what it is you either find it useful or could it be wrong that's the right. question um mm -hmm. it could be wrong okay i think it could be wrong um specifically the goal is to say here is a plausible mechanism for interact uh, interaction across multiple ontological categories which i am I don't know if there are others that have done this in quite as in this way. I don't actually know people that have models that are very intuitive. Um, so my, my whole thing, like I'm, I'm actually trying to defeat one argument, which is that uh, people will say dualism, metaphysical dualism must be false because there's no uh, answer to the interaction problem. Mm -hmm. Objects in different ontological categories cannot interact with one another. And so I'm saying, well, no, actually they could. This is this is a way to preserve effective interaction, but it's indirect interaction. But you effectively still get the state of the physical system affecting the state of the mental system and vice versa, if that's what you want to do. Um, so that that's really what I'm trying to accomplish is just knock down that one argument. Now, in terms of how I think things actually work, yeah, I mean, I do. I, I, this is my running metaphysical model. I think it's, I can't find a way to get rid of these different categories of nature. So... I think this works. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say, I mean, what would it even look like? I, I guess one example would be, so you just tell me in terms of saying the framework you just went through and, you know, for those who are watching the video to see those, the slideshow, what you know, your finished thing to say, oh yeah, in principle, you've got a bunch of inputs to go into this universal function. And then here's the outputs and the inputs and the outputs, again, are not merely mem elements of the physical material world. It could be anything, ideas, you know, uh, so forth, men mental states, what have you, feelings, hatred, jealousy, whatever. Um, so I'm saying at that level of abstraction, I guess one possible objection would be, oh, well, if you're using that word function, you know, that means there's a definite mapping. And so in principle, the sa if it's the same collection of inputs, it should always be the same output. Mm -hmm. And as I guess in principle that might not be true. Like there's no reason to suppose that needs to be true. Right. And like the, the, the free will question plays into that as well. Um, another possible uh, uh, objection would be, well, some people have said there's no physical world. So mm. they say everything fundamentally, there are idealists still out there. I think I mentioned Bernardo Castro earlier. He's an idealist. The guy who said the, he talks about the mind at large. 
Mm -hmm. um, he would say, yeah, I don't, I mean, maybe he'd say the concepts work, but he'd say, I don't think they're true because there isn't even the physical world. What you think of as the physical world is fundamentally collapsible to the mental world. Uh, okay. For me, I can't realistically, I'm not an idealist. Like I think that the theory of the physical world makes so much sense. I can't get rid of it. I think the idea of the mental world makes so much sense. I can't get rid of it. And now <clears throat> just in the past several years, I do think there's an abstract world. I think there's the domain of patterns and information which exist outside of our individual minds. So I guess I'm a, I'm a Platonist now, reluctantly become a Platonist. Um, there is one there is one concept here that might be uh, it's relevant to the idea of falsifiability, or or it sort of could, we could have some empirical um, uh, evidence that this is how the world works in physics. I always whenever anybody mentions quantum physics, you know. I, I go, uh oh, something bad's coming. Um, but there is one aspect of here. I'm not talking about superposition or anything like that. There's one aspect in quantum physics, which I think is officially uncontroversial, which is the idea of entanglement, that you could have two bits uh, of uh, atoms um, or sub subatomic particles or whatever that become entangled with one another and then at a distance with apparently no material mechanism for doing so, the, the state of one can affect the state of the other. So there's this idea, this traditional idea in physics of locality that in order to have objects interact with one another, they have to be in, in close proximity. There has to be touching effectively, if you will. Um, but this idea of quantum entanglement and non-locality is, is, uh, seems to suggest that the state of one bit can affect the state of another bit at arbitrary dense distances. And this is, to, the, to, the, to a modern physicist, this is like a wild concept. This is like a revolutionary idea. I think it was in the 1970s this was... Uh, more experimentally confirmed that aspects of the universe are non-local. I'm I'm not surprised by non-locality at all if that is indeed how the world works. And th and the mechanism that I've described here of indirect interaction is an inherently non-local. So it's saying, you know, it doesn't matter. You could have a, the state of your mind over here. The mm -hmm. Information about the state of the brain gets put into the universal function, and in theory, it could affect something on the other side of the universe. If the you know, if I'm thinking certain thoughts and maybe in some weird, you know, parallel, you know, galaxy that's over there, <clears throat> something is changing state because of my thoughts. It's possible. I mean, I, I don't think that's the world we live in, but at the very least, you know, this mechanism, uh, sort of, it, this mechanism would explain how non-local non -local interaction could work. You go, okay, well, it's not that things aren't actually directly interacting. What they are is indirectly interacting. The information about them is mm -hmm. separate from their, the actual underlying physical state. So given that we live in a world that appears to be one which includes non-local interaction, I do think that's some sort of evidence that uh, a system like this is let me be closer to the truth. Okay, that's that's interesting. Just to give a little background on all that stuff, because I think some people might not have heard this before. My understanding is that when Newton first proposed his law of gravity, leading scientists rejected that and they said what are you doing this is a relapse into the old you know medieval way don't you know we need mechanistic explanations things physically touch each other and that's how you know this that's modern science man yeah. this action at a distance that oh yeah the sun's over here and venus is over there and gravity moves it around even though can, can you touch gravity you know what, what do you mean gravity it's not a pole right what are you talking about it's not a big hook and so you know, and then it was like, oh, well, there's fields. And then that kind of turned into that. Oh, yeah, there's fields that are not material, but they propagate at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. It's And so that, yeah, it's, so it's not instantaneous. It's that, yeah, if there's a gravitational body here mm -hmm. affecting some other, that, you know, the gravitational waves had to traverse that interim space oh. first of all. And then, yeah, and then when quantum physics comes on the scene and, I, and it was, I think I'm getting this right. It, originally, Einstein and some others uh, recoiled from some of the interpretations that people, I mean, nobody could deny the experimental evidence and the, you know, people like saying, well, using these equations, I can predict what, you know, the readings on this thing are going to be better than anybody else. And okay, we'll use that. But in terms of like the philosophical, like, what does it all mean, man? Um, and Einstein recoiled from that and they had this thing called the EPR paradox and it was Einstein and I forget who the P and the R were different people. And yeah, they, like you're saying, they proposed it was it was a thought experiment, and they they were trying to show that no, our colleagues must be wrong. Quantum physics can't be like this, because if it were, then yeah, in principle, these two particles could interact here. We could move them far apart, and then if I go and like 
you know, measure the precision, the location of one of them precisely, then that would have implications for the wave function of this one. And it would have to be instantaneous. And we all know that's impossible. How would the right. information get from here to there? Cause it would travel faster than light. We know that's impossible. Right. And, and, but then like you say later, they, I think they confirmed that or, or you know, they yeah. did experiments that were like, no, actually. So it was ironic that Einstein and colleagues came up with a thing where they were trying to knock it down. And yet, at least in terms of yes, most modern physicists, I think they would say no, they were just wrong. But they distilled and crystallized down. This is what we're talking about, and it just turns out that yep, the evidence comes down on the side of the spooky action at a distance. Yeah, and and it, this is a. I think that history is generally correct, and I believe that some of the uh, confirmations came at the beginning in, in the seventies. <clears throat> it's a funny, funny aside. I was complaining about quantum physics before. Um, there, there's this idea. So there's different levels of heresy in physics, right? And mm -hmm. um, if you want to st stay within the graces of uh, like existing paradigms, there's this idea that in physics, um, you, you have a, a notion of realism and a locality. A realism being that there was a world out there that we're measuring that exists independent of our measurement. And locality being the idea that, as you were saying before, you know, things have to physically, mechanically, in close proximity, interact in order to uh, affect one another. You don't get action at a distance. And there's supposed to be this idea that um, uh, local realism, they say, has been falsified. So it's either the case that you have to give up realism or you have to give up locality. Now, this has bothered me to no end because there's a lot of people who have given up realism instead of giving up locality, which is just crazy to me. So they, so they think it's, it makes more theoretical sense to preserve the idea of there being only local interaction in the universe at the expense of saying, and there's no world out there outside of our measurement. Or if, if you want to say, you know, reality takes a state at the moment of measurement. Well, I mean, okay, maybe. <clears throat> Versus saying, oh, there's a reality out there. There's a physical world out there, even when you're not measuring it. And it, the, the world we live in allows for non-local interaction. You can have action at a distance. Um, in my mind, this is a much easier, much more theoretically palatable uh, conclusion. And if you don't have training in physics, it's like, yeah, why wouldn't that be the case? There's no, like, I understand there's like natural intuitions of things have to touch in order to interact, but that's, you know, I don't think they have to be, you know, devoted to that position as some people are like religiously devoted to that position. But yeah, in the 1970s, I think it was, there was some more uh, evidence that indeed entangled quantum uh, entanglement is a thing, non-local non interaction is a thing. Mm -hmm. And so if we're looking for, you know, a mechanism that's not crazy, that could explain non-local interaction, this that, that I've just provided is one. That in fact, the information is playing the central causal role here instead of the actual underlying physical bits. So we've been talking about this word information, and I think you said at one point, now we got to talk about what do we mean by that? I don't know if yeah. we ever actually did that. So what what is information? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So you, you'd think that one would be sorted out. Um, well, let me just, before you, yeah. and I've had like Winston Ewart on and I, like a computer scientist working in the intelligent design and information, like they're, you know, talk about information theory or whatever. Yeah. And it, I'm not saying they don't have a definition for it, but sometimes I worry that it's a bit circular. Yeah. And it's, I think it's, it's kind of, it's hard to say, well, we know what it is. You know, we know it when we see it kind of deal. And it's it's kind of hard to define yeah. what it is. So I I have not, I put it this way. I have not yet come across a definition of information I find actually satisfactory, fully, sat mm -hmm. fully satisfactory. There's like an, an information, you know, Shannon's information theory. There's this idea of what information is. I don't think it works. I think people are sort of confused about what information is. The best I can come up with, well, okay, there's two answers to this. Um, <clears throat> one is if we're speaking like just frankly, um, what can we say with confidence about information and how information works? In my mind, our direct experiences and interactions of information are mental. Uh, awareness, conscious awareness is closely connected to information. So when I say I have information about X, like I have some sort of abstract model in my mind mm -hmm. that corresponds to an underlying physical state. So there's one possibility, which, you know, the information thing is fundamentally mental and this would play in maybe to the divine conceptualist idea we talked about before that information is out there within the mind of god um and i i think uh the the other possibility is that it's somehow platonic that it is uh, it is an abstraction over and above you know physical structures 
and the abstraction exists outside of minds. Now, I don't have direct knowledge of abstractions existing outside of minds because I'm stuck in my mind. So all of my experience of abstractions is me thinking about them. But perhaps it's the case that like abstract things, abstract structures exist out there uh, in the world, just in a different domain than uh, physical stuff. So I think that's about as good as I can get you for uh, for information. It is uh, it is the way that I would say is it, it, there is a pattern. There is a form, if you like, mm -hmm. that is an abstraction that has a specific type of relationship to uh, uh, an underlying physical structure. But the abstraction or the information is not itself uh, physically extended. It's something that's over and yeah. above it. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it is tricky, you know, like to say, oh, there's information embedded in your DNA. Yeah. And there is this sense, and, you know, and it, it does raise the issue. Well, like, take an easier one that, oh, there's, there's a bunch of gibberish here. And then someone says, oh, wait a minute. No, this is written in code. If we just do this little trick and like take every letter and subtract one. Yeah. Look at it says, you know, I'm hiding here and da, 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 and the police come every two minutes and you need to rescue me between these, you know, and so, oh, there's information in there. So there is this sense in which there's more than just what meets the eye, like exactly. the, the, the arrangement, but yet it also kind of invokes like there has to be some conscious agent perceiving it. Well, and then the, you the, raise this stuff is like I see the question. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you think that that's the case, then I think you're committed to some sort of like God position, which is fine. Um, but it's not clear to me, actually, that the abstractions require mind. Um, so like, for example, uh, this is a, like, a, say there's a distant star and we talk when we're, you know, getting we're looking at the telescope and whatever and we get we see uh, uh, photons or we're registering photons over here. We talk as if we're getting information about the star through the light. But I think there's a distinction. This is the distinction actually that really bothers me. A lot of the information theorists talk about, let's say the photon that's coming through space as the information itself. Mm -hmm. and I don't think that works because the information, there is information attached to the photon, but the mm -hmm. information is not itself just the, the, the structureless or like meaningless yep, right, right. photon that the, the what it is is we're inferring a certain structure out there about how this what a star is and where it's located out in space based on a tiny little bit that we got but the, but the bit that we got is not the information it's something something over and above it yeah R right so yeah cuz what i was going to say is like if you're looking at some encrypted text and you want you can say oh yeah there there's information embedded in there and then you can say well suppose no one's looking at it or suppose people yeah. haven't cracked the code yet yeah yeah is the information still in there and there it's not as obvious and you, i think most people want to say yes but nobody's found it yet or something like that yeah suppose, right. especially if the original person died like the person who encoded yeah, encrypted yeah. it died so it's not even like that, that person's walking around mm -hmm. knowing right. the information and then you unlock it but and then it does but it, like you're saying it's kind of it's to me it seems like well the answer what however you want to answer that you got to get the same answer to uh you know, did, does the number nine exist if everyone's dead? You yeah, know, it's well, not obvious. <laughs> so like, uh, so I've got the water bottle here. Um, mm -hmm. I actually think this is the same problem with physical structures, generally speaking. Like, is there a bottle here or is there just atoms here? And uh, I've actually changed my mind on this over, over the years. I think there is effectively, um, there's effectively information here that exists over and above just the atoms. That is to say, specifically, the relations between the atoms are mm -hmm. real and they exist in addition to the atoms. Mm -hmm. the, the, the relations are the key part and the relations are something that's abstract. So in that case, I would say the relations between the atoms would still exist even if they weren't in minds. So that points to something in my, you know, in the way I'm thinking about it, like Platonism, because I don't yeah. want to say the relationships would somehow cease existing if there weren't minds. I do think they're just abstract relationships out there in some other mind independent domain. We're getting really heavy deep, deep in the metaphysics, yeah. by the way. This is the problem of universals, and like we haven't solved right, this right. in two thousand some odd years. So, and shoot, I can't remember the the full where one takes this, but I I I did watch something recently 
where somebody was like blowing up materialism and he said, yeah, there's, you know, the material universe. It, it was the reason I'm thinking of it is because it was similar to your first demonstration. And then, yep, we, it goes from this state to this state and there could be like inherent uncertainties and randomness, but blah, blah, blah you know, whatever. Still, once you characterize it. And so, the, yeah, there, it seems like there's these laws of physics, but clearly the laws of physics are themselves not physical. Right. You know, they're not material things. They're relationships, you yeah. know, principles, and then you say, rules, what is a relationship? patterns. And then yeah. so, and then, so you want to say like, do the laws of physics exist? And I think most materialists would have to say yes. And then it's like, are they material? No. And say, okay, so clearly existence is more than just the material yes. universe. I, I actually have an article that I'm just a short little article. I'm going to put on my sub stack here soon. Mm -hmm. That is a, it's called four steps to the immaterial. And it's exactly this. It's, mm -hmm. it's like it you're you're going to end up one way or another if you're speaking honestly saying something like well there are laws of physics and then you'll find these are not atomic objects these are not geometric objects these are not material objects so it must be that in order to describe even the physical world you're positing we're, we're stuck with the immaterial mm -hmm. That's people a lot uh, crazy but i do think it's a very good argument what th does this have any relationship to the fame david hume's famous is ought distinction I know it, it would have a relation to him criticizing um, uh, the idea of causality. So like this is directly related. He was saying, you know, everybody's been assuming that causality is real, but we don't actually see causality. We just infer causality. Um, but no, I, can you can you make the connection? Sure, for me? because uh, as I understand it, like it's a pretty straightforward. There's facts of the physical world. And how could they possibly interact with what you ought to do? Like those are, they're just, they're two mm. different ontological things. There can't be any passage between mm. them. Morality is what it is, what you ought to do. And then there is what there is a positive of the norm. And there's this huge chasm between them. And yeah. how could you go from one to the other? Yeah. So I think you're kind of opening up a framework to say in principle, we could have the, you know, the spirit interacting with the boulder. Oh yeah. No. Well, so Platonism, my world has been upended by the experience of love and also by Platonism. Uh, several years mm -hmm. ago, I'm still seeing all of the implications here, but at some point you could, you can talk about, you know, the good that like there are not only are there structures that are made up of, you know, entities and their relationships and their abstract relationships, but some of those structures and relationships are good in some like deep ontological sense. Um, and that's a wild, that's a wild idea. But I think, you know, so you talk about, you know, what is the form of justice? And mm -hmm. I think this is very hard for the modern mind to wrap your head around this platonic way of thinking. But I think if we change the language, and actually some of these questions make a great deal of sense. Like um, if one were to try to program a computer or, or observe the a program of a computer, you could sort of pick out general patterns and categories and high, high, high level abstractions that do sort of exist um, out there. Like, like, for example, sorry, but I know we're getting into the weeds here, but like um, we're talking about a dog mm -hmm. and the computer program. You can have a, like, a like a function in the code of what a dog is, and that function could be called a bunch of times. It could be the, the dog, the abstract form of the dog is out there in some sense. And then over here, it's instantiated. Over here, it's instantiated. And over there, it's instantiated. And suddenly, we're stuck in, in Platonism. <laughs> or like, okay, well, what is the form? You can point to the individual examples of the dog, but can't you also point to the the abstract form or structure or concept of the dog as well. And there it is in the code. You know, this, the, this mm -hmm. is the thing we're talking about when we're talking about abstractions. It's the code. It's not what the code instantiates. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm just looking at the clock. So I think we need to wrap up. Yeah. Um, so what, what do you have a, a final thought here? I, I don't know how to, <laughs> summarize what we just went through. I think we just took the, the listeners along for a ride and yeah, we concluded that neither Steve nor Bob knows what information is. Yeah, we were, uh, we took them along for the ride, but like roller coaster tycoons, some of the, um, some of the coasters aren't finished and you can launch people <laughs> off to their death. And I kind of feel like that's where we uh, ended with that one. No, uh, the final word would just be, uh, I think, I think this is, I, I, you know, listeners, you know, feel free to chime in. Is this a good enough intuitive model to say, here's how we could have objects in different ontological categories effectively interact with one another. And if the answer is yes, then I think, you know, mission accomplished. I think that's something that's important because at least that, that allows us now to be dualists or ontological pluralists, if you like, mm -hmm. which is a, it's a much nicer position to be in than trying to be, you know, reduce everything to one type of ontology. Well, 
how do you feel about this? Like, so yeah, with, with Hume saying that there's, you can't derive an, an ought from an is, you know, there's this fundamental distinction between the, you know, the material world and, or the you know, normative and the positive, or then somebody saying you, you can't explain, you know, the physical world by reference to mental experiences and what, and then you're just saying, why not? I mean, is it, is there more going on than, than just that? I mean, I know there's more than that, but I'm saying yeah. it is, could, could you be taken to be saying that? And then you can, you know, elaborate and, and give your functional, you know, framework. But I mean, at, at the heart of it, it seems like you're saying who said, why, why, yeah. why can't we? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, to put it in, frankly, you know, Descartes didn't give us a good answer to do the interaction problem. Nobody else has. I think this is this is an answer. Like, yeah, you can. I don't. Why why can't you have interaction across multiple multiple ontological categories? I think it's just been mm -hmm. a lack of creativity to come up with something that is at least plausible. Yeah. Well, I guess. I guess the last thing here, I'll ask you and let you. I could see a critic looking at what you just did and say, "No, Steve, you didn't. You didn't um, show us how it could work. You just kind of formalized the the idea that it could work." Like you didn't really give us any specifics or anything testable. You just kind of said this more abstract formal formulation of yeah. this is what it would look like if reality worked this way. Yeah. Do you have yeah. a problem with that? Or No, not really. I, I'm okay. not saying this is how it is. I'm just, I, I think maybe perhaps the, um, what's missing is that this, the, the interaction problem has been considered like devastating. It's been mm -hmm. like, oh, this is th this points to something so deep and profound that we have to give up dualism, mm -hmm. and that's just uh, I just don't think that's true. I mean, c clearly, if like there are, there are questions here that aren't answered about what information is, about how the information goes from the material to the immaterial or whatever. Like, there's mm -hmm. this is not a perfect theory, but you know, does this have enough legs where you can go, okay, we can work with this? Like the objection that there's some intrinsic problem with dualism because of the interaction mm. problem i think is refuted mm. and even if it didn't have enough legs who says it needs legs it could just exactly. be held up by the notion of pie yeah I and uh pie. and what was it that you mentioned sushi right? <laughs> yeah <laughs> by pie though i meant okay well i think at this point we need to stop if we're making math puns involving cake <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my guest this has been Steve Patterson. As always, Steve, a very interesting, thought-provoking uh, discussion. Wh where should people go if they want to see more? Well, uh, thanks, Bob. It's always a pleasure. Um, so uh, last we spoke, I said I was uh, in the process of starting an institute called the Natural Philosophy Institute, and it's still mm -hmm. in the process. Um, I was going to try to do a soft launch, but um, I actually just recently wrote a book with um, Roger Veer on Bitcoin, and we're... Um, we're going to be working on some getting some translations done and so i'm still i'll still be working kind of on that project for the next few months um but everybody in your audience is going to love the natural philosophy institute it's just the coolest thing ever it's going to be the coolest thing ever um and if you want to learn about it you can go to natphi.org natphi.org and if you want to read um my work you can go to steve-patterson.com i also have a sub stack and a youtube channel for you know ideas like this Okay, what, what was the NATP thing? You said that fast. NATPHI.org, the Natural Philosophy Institute. It's, okay. um, yeah, it's going to be really awesome. <laughs> okay, but it, it is up and running? It was the softest? No, no. Oh, okay. no, no, we were going to do a soft, I was going to try to get it done before this okay. interview, because um, I okay. think your audience would really like it, but uh, it, it's going to be several months yet before it's live. I got you. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we'll have you back. Yeah, just reach out when you want to push people and we'll do that cool. Thanks, Bob. All right. Well, thanks, Steve. And thank you folks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit BobMurphyShow.com.